So it's my pleasure. It's my honor to be here and to be able to show you the studio. Um, you know, it's been very difficult after the blast. So thank you for giving us this opportunity from our side. Thank you. So actually, we are now in Jamesa Street, right? That's right. Shall I get started? Yeah, please. We are ready. Okay. Just to introduce you, this is 50. See, she's our mascot dog. <laughs> um, yes, this is Jamesa Street, and this is one of the streets that were was very uh, much uh, um, hurt from the blast. So we can show you how the whole street is under construction because everybody from the first day after the blast, they started to, to fix the whole street. But I chose actually, so we have a boutique on the ground floor and we have a studio on the second floor and it's a studio and gallery on the second floor. So the ground floor was used for our home accessories and it's just a small little boutique where we, we actually decided to highlight the, um, the ceiling details. And here we decided not to fix the space because we chose to keep it as a memorial because I don't feel that we um, processed the whole blast yet. And so, whereas everybody else started to fix. So I thought it would be really nice to just keep a little memory. And inside this boutique, you will see, we actually left everything broken as is. Mm -hmm. So you have the broken mirrors and the shelving and the broken lamps. And so some of the furniture has been completely destroyed. But what we also did is, you can see this cabinet here. And this cabinet is actually made of all the broken windows of our studio gallery. Oh. And you can see that this is all just the window frames and the, uh, of the studio. And, uh, and what we did is we used our marquetry technique to actually tie them together in a way. And we called this collection keeping it together because to be honest, we're trying to keep it together today. <laughs> you know, it's very difficult with the economic situation, the political situation, COVID, and then the blast came and we're really struggling a lot. Mm. And so for me, this was like a, such an important thing. And we also created a logo immediately because this was the feeling I had. Our space is destroyed, but we are not. And I felt that it was so important to highlight this because this has given a lot of um, uh, power to other designers and to people on the street. And it was a stencil that we put in different on, throughout the street. Um, what we're highlighting here now is actually a bowl also made of the broken glass and we put it in resin and we lit it from below. And so also this is a way of keeping, keeping it together as well. So uh, yeah, this is all. <laughs> so what I'm like, what I'm going to do now is mm. uh, I don't want to show too much sadness. <laughs> no, it's I okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so here's also another table we made out of the pieces. So this is the marquetry technique that we've been working on, and here you can see that these are the colors of the Lebanese flag. Um, uh, we we did that on purpose, and. Mm. Yeah, it's clear. When did you open your boutique store in uh, Jamesa so, Street? So on Jamesa Street, we opened in 2018, but I've been in another area called Saifi Village uh, mm. from 2003. And the reason we moved to uh, Jamesa is, you'll see that this is a building, it's a 1930s building. And because my work is all about preserving heritage and crafts, but in a new way, I thought it would be interesting to be in an old, building and then show contemporary work inside the old building and mm. uh, so this is one of the few really large building blocks on the street and this is a 1930s building and you can feel that it's a very solid building and um, it's uh, um, it's home to a few state offices like plastic studios 
uh, and there were some production studios as well. Mm -hmm. um, and what I tried to do in this boutique is kind of make it a communal space. So we created some like benches says, you know, unfold me. And uh, here, a lot of people, we used to sometimes find them at nighttime sitting and having a drink or a coffee, um, you know, so hey, just to create a little atmosphere within uh, the boutique. So what I'd like to do now is uh, take you upstairs to Let's the go. second floor. Yes. Okay. So you'll see the architecture is really beautiful. And as we go up the stairs, you'll see how things are, how things were. It was quite destroyed. So here, you can see, I'll bring it. You can see the electrical panels too <laughs> of the whole building. It's really almost like a piece of art. And here, like some of the, you know, not everybody were, was able to. Uh, Fix. I think this is another studio that's completely destroyed. So the studio, our space was really, really broken. And um, maybe 60% of our pieces were completely destroyed. So you'll see the walls were like that. Mm -hmm. This is an old elevator, which people love to go up because it's all has wooden interiors, but you can see how the blast completely pushed it. So we can't use it anymore. So we are near the port, extremely close to the port. So you can see the destroyed buildings around it. We're really maybe, I would say like less than a kilometer <laughs> from the port. And, um, you know, we had this initial reaction of immediately fixing, but like plastic studios and other studios, they wanted to take their time because they weren't sure of the future. But for me, it was so important to get ourselves back on track. I felt this sense of responsibility. I don't know why. <laughs> the sense of responsibility that as somebody that you know, is leading in this field. If I don't stand up and be strong, then, you know, it would be a bad example. <laughs> so this, I wanted to show you something very cute. So before there was no elevator. So people used to sit, you know, sometimes. Like Take that. a breath. <laughs> yeah. We complete, we, we added the stencil as well here, just to, uh, highlight. So this is our entrance and uh, welcome to our studio. So as you walk in, it's a 1930s um, Lebanese uh, apartment and Lebanese apartments always have white Carrara marble on the floor and they often have this white uh, uh, black detailing. And uh, so here is a place where we show not only uh, we show our furniture, but we also have a sample room uh, and all the studio and uh, even the admin. And to me, the whole move from Saifi village to Jamezi Street, we called it up close and personal. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, first of all, I wanted our space to be a little discovery. So it's upstairs, it's hidden, and it's often by appointment only. And downstairs would be the boutique for people who want to buy gifts. And close, so you say up close and personal. Close, I felt that I wanted people to be, people now have become very, very conscious of design. And they often sometimes even want to be part of the design process. And so I often found myself like, noticing that a lot of our clients are like, can we change the color? Can we do this? And so I thought we would give this platform for um, customers and designers um, when they want to make the furniture to actually come up with uh, their own, you know, um, mm. uh, you know, to have their own input 
because at the end, the pieces, they're living with them. So it would be nice when they see the pieces at home or in their offices that they felt that they were part of the um, uh, creative process and that they can connect to it better. And then uh, personal is the fact that it, it's the whole atmosphere. You know, sometimes design is very intimidating, especially luxury design. And I wanted it to be um, for people to have a personal experience as if they're coming to a home. So our staff are all friendly. We like to serve coffee and uh, in a, as if you're coming and visiting home. So the whole move was called Up Close and Personal. So this, is, this was one of our studio spaces, uh, to our gallery spaces, but we dedicated now this space mainly for our home accessories. So you will see uh, uh, what we do is we use craft um, and we try to come up with new techniques with craft and apply it in, in contemporary lines. So these are more the traditional classic pieces that we used to do in the past um, with Mother of Pearl, but we've actually moved on in many, <laughs> many ways uh, because the whole idea of what we do is to come up with new craft techniques. So for example, this planter is using the, the marquetry mania. We call it punketry because it's marquetry, but with a bit of fun. And these are like trays. We were being patriotic at one point using you know, the Lebanese uh, flag colors. We have even like, you know, desk accessories uh, for you can put your pen and a card. So we do corporate gifts and, you know, home accessories. Um, so this is a room where we actually show pieces and Nisreen, our salesperson, usually sits here on this desk um, and she receives the people here instead of downstairs. So downstairs has become more like an installation space. Um, so here we sell like even small, uh, you know, emojis or, you know, because people, people want a piece of leather, they did sometimes they don't need a piece of furniture and they're happy to just buy a small object. I have so a question. I'm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, how deep do you think the, let's say the Arabian culture or heritage patterns and designs, etc., actually inspiring you in your pieces and designs? Yes. Uh, how saying, big do you sorry, think? Sorry, I yeah. missed the question. It just sorry, I was saying uh, how how big, how big does yeah these patterns, the Arabian patterns, or the, let's say the heritage patterns that we are using, uh, the new designs inspiring you? Yeah. yeah. So I I started of course with the Islamic geometric patterns, and uh, and for me it's it's about how we use craft to. Um, uh, use those patterns in in and manif manifest them in different ways. So sometimes, for example, uh, I'm going to take you in now to what we call the salon, and the salon is um, where we really put our main furniture pieces. For example, like here we have some prototypes, uh, like this tray, uh, this uh, this pattern is an exaggerated Islamic geometry. And here we mixed it with, with marquetry. So you can see that we've used different materials like plastic laminate and then the punketry pattern. And so this, when you really in, uh, stand back, it's really a part of an Islamic geometric pattern. So we, we like to play with the pattern, but I sometimes I like to actually exaggerate it or, or use just a part of it because it's not always um, I want it to be something in the back backdrop, and I, for me, the important thing is highlighting the craft itself. So, what you see here in this room. So, uh, in a Lebanese typical Lebanese home, the salon is has white Carrara marble, the entrance and the salon, like I had mentioned. But then all the bedroom, uh, sorry, the bedrooms or the rooms of it have these uh, tiles, which are the more uh, travertine tiles, which are done these in these beautiful patterns. And they call them carpets, you know, like sujed, <laughs> because they look like carpets. So you actually almost don't even need a carpet. So every room is a different color. And, uh, and it's quite fun to, uh, 
to play. You see every house, old houses like that. And what you see here is, um, so after the blast, all these windows uh, broke, the doors broke. So we, some of the doors we didn't even put back because, you know, it cost us a lot to be honest, to, to put everything up. Uh, you know, I don't know, because of the situation, the economic situation, there was no insurance that paid. So everything was, was done by us and we wanted to move in quickly. So all these broken uh, windows and the furniture was completely destroyed. Um, we had before this a very colorful collection of, um, of furniture. And after the blast, we were all, you know, of course it was really sad. And so we started to focus on, you know, more blacks and whites and grays, like as if it's like suddenly a black and white movie. So from a color, we went to black and white and we called this collection back to basics. We wanted to kind of take our typical pieces, our popular pieces and do them in black and white and grays because that was the mood that we were in. So if you see like, for example, this was, uh, you know, we've, this is our um, funketry cabinet and you can see how we applied the tech, the funketry in all these black and white patterns. So yeah, these also are, you know, little Islamic geometry and they also look quite contemporary the way they're put uh, with marble here. And then uh, here we have like a sofa. It's almost like a diwan sofa. And what we did is we did the carving technique here. And here's the resin. So for me, it's all about geometry, but it's also about intricacy. I feel that when you do intricate work, it actually, uh, there's something, you know, um, that's very soulful. Like it, you feel like you just want to get close to it and touch it and feel it. And this is one of our later piece, new work collections, which is called Marketry Mania, is where I actually sp splash the marketry uh, strips all over the table. And I wanted something a little bit bold and contemporary and um, strong. So as we go around, uh, you'll see, this is another version. Uh, of applying the marquetry around curved surfaces. So today I feel like, you know, we really care about touch, especially with COVID. So, you know, smooth surfaces, I think has become something people are searching for today. They want something that, you know, they can touch and feel good about. And also I feel that um, with the marquetry, people want to just touch and feel. <laughs> so here you can see that, um, we have the pebble table, which is a very popular piece worldwide. And we made it in the three shades, gray, white, and black. And this is our latest, latest piece, which I was experimenting with um, organic shapes. So what we did is we actually carved the legs, the solid legs, and then, and then we also put a you know, repetitive pattern in a degradation form. So I feel that this is like the beginning of a, another collection. Because again, people miss the outdoors, people miss, you know, um, something like uh, uh, organic. So this is a beginning of something. Um, I'm going to take you now to uh, our sample room. And I would say that this is um, the heart and soul of, of the brand. Um, what's special about this is that when I first came, so I grew up in Japan and I lived in the UK and the US and I came to Beirut and I asked about what is, you know, what is furniture from this region? And, uh, you know, everyone said, just go to Damascus and you'll see. And this is where I learned about the craft of mother of pearl inlay. So I started by making all these samples uh, of mother of pearl here, as you can see a lot of traditional traditional samples because this is the kind of uh, work that first I was introduced to. And then slowly I started to uh, do it in a more contemporary way. So, you know, no one had done like striped mother of pearl before, you know, it was something very 
it was mostly very organic uh, flowers and etc. So here you'll see so many samples. You know, I started to do the Japanese pattern. I started to do just plain patterns, like all in all in uh, mother of pearl instead of now today maybe it doesn't seem unusual but that this is talking about 15 years ago <laughs> more than that uh even you know the different shades of mother of pearl you know we can create this month. and from there i started to experiment because i felt that we could actually um, take the tradition and do it a little bit more contemporary. Mm -hmm. So I started to remove like, like within the mother of pearl, there's this tin. This is called azdir. And tin is like, it comes like that. And this is something that does not rust. It's, it's a malleable material. It's a beautiful piece. And this is what is set in. So it's chiseled in by hand. So all this tin is chiseled in one by one. And so just when we chiseled it in, I thought maybe we can just not add mother of pearl, but just start using it in contemporary forms. So in contem contemporary patterns. So this is what we did, just simple lines. And this took a life of its own actually. <laughs> um, and today, you know, a lot of people maybe have used it, but it was quite, quite contemporary at the time. I believe this room by itself needs a tour by itself. Yeah, <laughs> I can take you. I love uh, it's, it. This is where my, someone told me, this is where my eyes light up because really I just love, you know, experimenting. And, you know, that's like, to me, more important actually than the end piece. This is where I get inspired. Um, so as we move forward, we have hand carving. And then we have, for example, you know, the nails like hammering. So the, this uh, craft of hammering, most people, you know, they have chests like uh, wedding chests with uh, brass. But I thought, why don't we use upholstery nails because they're so beautiful. To me, these nails are a piece of art, each piece. <laughs> so for me, this is like really uh, uh, an interesting, um, you know, technique that we could use. Um, so, and here, we have some uh, glass and here some hand carving. So we started to do like uh, sofa legs or bed legs like this by hand carving uh, or table legs. And I love hand carving and I just love this actual pattern, <laughs> just simple diamonds. But it's not as simple as it looks because when you look here, it starts with small to large. But when it's small, it has to be shallow. And when it's large, it's deep. So the craftsman has to know all these details when they're working. Um, and then we come here, maybe I'll take you here. So this is the craft of marketry. So you know the backgammon games or the traditional uh, uh, games, uh, they often use the craft and they put uh, these, so these are, I don't know if you know how it's made, but it's actually pieces of wood that are put together. Can you see the details? All these little solid sections and they turn it around and they slice it and they come up with this. And what we did is we made our own patterns. So we have all these fun colors. This is ours. So this is the back you can see the detail yes and then this is the other side and this is what we slice and so all this that you saw on, on the other furniture pieces uh these are all the the patterns so this and, is how you're and, and doing your uh marketing the market right? yeah. yes yes and then when you see that they curve so when i made the uh, market remania collection where you have the uh, these uh, funketry patterns going strips going around the circular thing. The reason is because we found that this is curvy. So we came up with the idea of making circular tables from this. We didn't come up, I didn't say, oh, I want to make tables that are curvy. I started with what the craft can do and what, and we use the craft. All materials are adaptable. Yeah. 
So this is like, this is so fun. And we still, we still come up with all kinds of patterns. You know, we're always experimenting with new colors and um, patterns. As we move forward, uh, I was very interested on, in applying like mother of pearl and concrete. So we started by doing like these little butterflies uh, in concrete. And what's interesting about this is that, you know, um, concrete is a very um, mass produced, you know, uh, material, man-made. Mother of pearl is organic and it's done by hand. And so this contrast of inlaying something organic in, in a concrete mass produced, it actually elevated the concrete to become more noble. And I, I like this idea of, um, you know, contrast. Here we've applied it in uh, granite and terrazzo, sorry, and terrazzo. So, and then for example, if you see here, we created some texture and this one is hand carved in wood first. And then we create a silicone mold and then from the mold we create these concrete uh, tiles so this is like endless here it's uh, it's been really like uh, amazing <laughs> here's one in, in pink pink concrete mm. this is terrazzo here so i wanted to like uh, so you see the tiles on the floor so this is this is like a typical traditional uh, lebanese tile and they asked us to do a, a collaboration with them. This is a company called Lachaya. And so I decided to create, as I asked them if we can actually introduce brass. So here it is, you can see, I created these tiles with two tones and I added brass. And this creates a really interesting, um, you know, you can create like beautiful tiles for, for guest bathrooms uh, and everything. Thing is done in uh, how do you do it in a two thirds one third and two thirds so you can apply it in uh, you know as straight lines or you can play with it I, I need to see how it's done <laughs> yeah but, but there's always a way to attach them so there's something really fun about these uh, then we go to resin that's also a material that uh, we wanted to work with. So what we did is we had the same craftsman. Instead of laying it in wood, we asked him to lay it on plexi, and then we poured resin on top of it. And so you can see that this became like really modern and uh, fun. And this became like added this kind of useful uh, contemporary um, feel to, uh, to traditional patterns. Here you'll see uh, playing with metal and what we did here was we did this acid treated effect so this is acid treat treating uh, so this is very masculine so it's nice on a drawer front or a cabinet door so you can see that there's like we have a miniature arabesque chair you have you can see how we're trying to apply so this is a cabinet that we're working on it's a corner of a cabinet where we're applying the market tree on a curve. So you'll see concrete like that. So really this is like jewelry boxes. We're experimenting with the different finishes. So yeah, so this is where we meet with our clients. So we sit on the table and we start, we show our products on the screen. Uh, I just wanted to show you what our studio looked like here. So, uh, sorry, our boutique downstairs. So this is what it looked like. Now it's not like this. <laughs> so here we have more experiments with, uh, with leather, stamped leather, and also doing it in a way like a marquetry. It's endless here. So not only do I get inspiration from craftsmen and uh, I actually get inspired by the, uh, my clients because sometimes they get, they get so excited that uh, <laughs> they give me ideas too. 
So at the end, the pieces that we make are often really a uh, collaborative piece. And that's yes. like a big, big pleasure, you know, for me, because I feel like at the end, the pieces are going in their spaces. So uh, it's really impo important that they put their input. Yeah, it's very clear. Well, I think that you are most inspired by the materials, let's say. Yes, I think I'm inspired by material uh, and what the material can do. But I try to retain the geometry. And for me, again, we're talking about geometry, but geometry is, you know, I grew up in Japan among different nationalities and different religions. And I felt that geometry is that one universal language that everybody in the world can understand. So we don't have to actually, um, you know, we don't have to explain it. People understand mm -hmm. it. And so that's why I try to, I feel that that's kind of like my language. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take you now to, to our workshop, like kind of like ex prototyping. It's not really a workshop where we have our big machine, but it's where we experiment with materials. Um, so you saw how the windows uh, of the studio was completely broken. So they, they were pieces like this, you know, you see the hinges. And so, you know, we were experimenting here by hand carving um, and seeing, you know, what would, what would it look like if we played with it? And, you know, I haven't done anything yet with this technique because I think it's something very beautiful. Um, but what we thought was really interesting because all these window mummians have different um, sections. And so what we did is we took the section of these pieces of wood and we sliced them. And you can see how we, we laid them out like this because we were, as I said, I really love patterns. And here, what we did is we put a mold, we created a, um, a frame and we poured like resin plaster. It's a kind of plaster. And now what you see here, it could be a tabletop or a door panel. And I think that, you know, this is also a way of keeping it together. And that's why we called it keeping it together. But to me, I think this is like the beginning of something really interesting. And that's like, we're, we're taking the beautiful mullions of, and the sections of these window frames and creating patterns out of them. Do you like it? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> it's one of my favorite, actually. <laughs> I like the idea is keeping it together. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, now we, we haven't designed the furniture yet. We have some ideas, but it starts with this. So this will go on my desk for a few months, maybe a few weeks. And suddenly one day I will have a design ready. And these are another way of keeping the glass, the broken glass pieces here. And uh, we made a sample of the glass with resin. And you can see it's so interesting. And we had put light against it and we felt, I don't know if we can see the effect of the light. Maybe you see it a little bit in the back. So we thought this was so interesting that we could maybe make lighting. So we created, we created these wall lights and they will have like a brass in front of it. And when you light it, it will create this circle. Shit in the back. Mm. Yeah. So this is how we, uh, we took, you know, something broken and tried to make something positive out of it. <laughs> so next is the, yes. So I'm gonna take you now to um, the studio where my, my uh, the team is working. But just to show you throughout the office, even our candidates, we tried to do you know, to show the different applications of throughout the office. And this is here. So now because we're on lockdown, everyone took their computers home, but this is like our studio uh, where all my designers work here. And on in the center table, we have our drawings and we look at uh, the different sample colors and, uh, you know. Mm. You know, we're working on a bar and we're deciding on which uh, stone to use. <laughs> mm. 
So I, I have a few questions about how you yeah. started, and uh, I will just tell everyone to check uh, the, uh, our previous talk with you back in July 2020, because you told us the, uh, all the story, so people can... Yes our playlist for the interior design and they can check uh, how you started but yeah. what is your advice to someone who would want to start to explore these fine crafts and creativity as a designer i think for me if you just first thing is to visit the craftsmen themselves because they can they can be in, incredible inspiration you know listening to them watching them working um and then seeing what you can do with uh what they what they have um, because of course we can read textbooks but when you touch and feel and watch how they're doing it you can get inspired with the um, with the end result you know you can change their process the problem is when I before I came so I came here around 20 years ago and what I noticed that is that people um, never thought that they can actually uh, touch anything from the past like they felt guilty to to change the pattern or to change the form because it was something that kept going. I think that we we can retain that. There's nothing wrong with keeping uh, the pieces from the past. But today we live in different times. We have technology. Uh, our lifestyles are different. And it's not wrong to actually take craft or heritage and, and update it and make it more uh, relevant to our lifestyle. And, and, you know, in a way, like I feel when I started to do it, I felt like I gave permission. Suddenly, it be, you know, I gave permission that it's okay to do it. It's not wrong. We're not hurting, hurting the past. We're not, we're not um, uh, changing it, changing it. We're not destroying it. We're actually, it's, it's an evolution. And I believe that um, it's important that we actually, uh, there's an evolution. Otherwise, you know, it, it doesn't make sense for something to perpetuate. And I'm sure even the crafts that we see from 200 years ago was an evolution from something before. So here, just to interrupt, uh, uh, this is the collection I launched last year in March. This is the IKEA uh, collection, the Ramadan collection for IKEA. We worked on, uh, again, exaggerated patterns and ap applying it uh, mainly it was a hexagon. We worked on the hexagon shape. And here you'll see the carpet that we made in Afghanistan. So this was an initiative to empower the, the women carpet weavers in Afghanistan. How important do you think for, let's say, the Arabian best book furniture factories and manufacturers and designers to, to be inspired with their culture and design heritage, instead of focusing on Western and European, uh, let's say, trends? Yeah. You know, for me, this was something that, look, I, I'm not against the Western and European trends. I think they're great. Like a sofa manufacturer in Italy mm -hmm. is very good quality. So I would prefer to make a sofa, to get a sofa from Italy, but the accent and like the coffee table and the side tables. I think we have incredible craftsmen, incredible workmanship. And I think those are the pieces that we actually will be looking at. So when we're sitting on a sofa, we're not looking at the sofa, <laughs> but when we're sitting <laughs> on the weekend, we're looking at a table or a we are touching it or feeling it. And um, I think that's where you can actually apply the craft. And I really, really think that we need to value our craft craftsmen. We need to value our, our heritage because when you value your craft and heritage you're actually valuing yourself and that's why i noticed for example in france or england or italy they really really value their people their craftsmen because they're proud and uh, i think we're very proud and we have a lot to be proud of and mm. you know coming from abroad i noticed that that we weren't as proud because they weren't Or today, you know, that's why the young people, I think it's really important that, you know, and I think this new generation is already doing it, you know, they're really, really valuing, they want something that belongs to them, and their identity. Um, so, yeah, I'm not against uh, West European uh, furniture, but I think, you know, we also have a lot to offer, 
you know, and not only that, I think the Europeans love what we do. So yes. it's really the opposite, you know, it's, it's actually mutual. It's really, mm. uh, um, I don't think one uh, puts down the other. And that's yes. not how we should see it. Yeah, I feel we should see it as that we're equal, not lower, not higher. <laughs> yeah. So maybe I'll take you last to uh, to my office. Yes. Yeah. So we go through. I I took the I think the best room in the, yeah. in the yeah. No, I told you to corner. keep it to the last <laughs> so yeah, we can yeah, see what's exactly. happening there. Yeah. So this is a room which is uh, on the corner mm -hmm. of the building. So I have a view of um, of Jamesi Street. And we have it's, it's a beautiful view and you can see the old Lebanese architecture of the three arches and the influences of the Ottoman and the French art deco and uh, you know you see the banners that were saying we will rise again resuscitation <laughs> it's uh, we're all here to support each other and uh, so Here's a photograph of a um, photographer named Tanya Krabulsi. You can see it's all completely broken, but this is like to me, like my little window where I look at the sea and I feel like Beirut, to me, Beirut is the sea and the colors of the sea. And here again, I have like, you know, samples that I look at every day. So this, this is hand carving, but we decided to use braid. You know, so our craftsman who's used to doing like geometric things uh, created this braid and I'm wondering what to do with it. Any suggestions? <laughs> so sometimes these things sit here and uh, you know, I sit on my desk <laughs> here and um, I have like sometimes uh, drawings done. This is our new pebble post. And there's so many different ways of applying craft on the backs of them. So we have to choose like five patterns and I every day sit and look at it and see what I can do. Um, check my emails. Uh, you'll see my shoe collection. <laughs> I love uh, experimenting with shoes. And I don't know if, I think I did mention before I did the collection with Fratelli Rosetti, mm. and some heels. I will show it to you in a bit. So, you know, I took a top shop shoe and I'm like, let's try to apply a craft on it. I even wore them for this one too. <laughs> it was fun. Well, I have an interesting question. Yeah. How long do you spend usually in your studio? In my studio? Yeah. How long uh, do you stay there? You Since you have in my office or in the studio itself? Well, you've shown us a lot of team. both the team and in general yeah. in the studio. So yeah. I come, I come around ten a.m. and and my my team comes around nine. I come around ten. They would have prepared all the drawings and things for me to look at, um, and and we work on you know like uh, color schemes. We work on details. Um, there's a lot of you know a lot of the. Our business is also like you know administrative which is like yeah. you know pricing costing we need to make sure that costing is right the pricing is right so um but it's not only me, design it's not only design i mean design is like i don't know maybe 30 percent 20 percent 70 percent is processing drawings uh, technical drawing samples talking to clients you know and uh you know also business development finding new clients so it's really a lot of a lot of that um i mean for me my pleasure is sitting with the craftsmen and yeah, coming this up is, with new new that's yeah, like I, my my biggest pleasure yeah sorry <laughs> I, I, this is the second part of the question actually because yeah. we, we we've seen plenty of materials that is actually inspiring you to design new furniture so comparing yeah. to the office hours how how long should the designer in, invest and in, with the craftsmen with the workshops etc to to think about materials and designs i think that they uh, i think that's the core of the business you know i think so you have to at the beginning at least like if I say when I first started, 
I used to, I used to spend maybe like 50 percent of my time with the craftsmen because that's where I did the prototypes because we would make the big pieces and you know work on the forms and that would be every day I, I used to go every single day to the workshop until you felt and, that and, you mastered all the yeah yeah <laughs> and then and then uh, because I started alone you know I was alone one person mm. just me and then eventually you know then I had someone with me and then they would uh, they would learn you know how how it is and sometimes they would go on my behalf but at the end especially with our customized pieces that have never been done before I'm always there at the workshop I mean I I uh, I'm there to make sure the proportions are right because even if we draw everything when you actually see it in three-dimensional it might not be the right proportion so and the most important thing uh, is not finishing the whole thing, like doing the process. So at every process, every single process, we actually go up and check it. So like if we're making a, a sofa, for example, we have to see the wood before it's upholstered and then after the upholstery and then the finishing phase or with the wood before. So the proportions before we put the craft and then we apply the craft. It's a, craft applied properly um, and then after that the finishing and one thing that I noticed and I think uh, what stands out with my work I believe is the finishing phase because that's I think the weakest part in our part of the world of our furniture making is because most people they just want to finish it put a coat of uh, you know polyurethane or put a French coat uh, polish and uh, that's it but it's actually and that's it. exactly yeah it's <laughs> actually the most important part is the finish mm -hmm. and I would say 40% of the time and the cost should go into finishing like if I were to because that's where where it would make the difference you know the so like for example yeah yeah, but I wanted to ask another question. What yeah. is the, let's say, the average lead time to design a product or let's say a chair from design from up to, from scratch from up to completing it? Usually how long it takes. So that will you give know, us an idea of reaching this kind of quality. This will require yeah. an average time of X. Yeah, so I would say design maybe two to four weeks depends how complicated it is but you know i start with a sketch then i give it to my designers and then they draw it and then we work on the proportions uh so that would take like two like four it could take a month even especially if, if it's a chair chair is a special you know chair is is um to a designer i think what a bridge is to an architect you know the chair is like, like a very difficult piece because you need to make a chair to to uh, carry a fat person a thin person a tall person a short person so a chair is like one of the most difficult but let's say a table yeah I would say like two to four weeks to come up with ideas if a client comes to me what we do is we propose two or three concepts we don't just do one we we give two or three directions so that the client has time uh, has an option um, we show the client and then after they approve the direction, we fine tune it and then we take another week or two and then becomes time to produce. But even when we produce, if it's a brand new piece, we have to do a prototype. So we make sure the proportions are correct. That's another two, three, four weeks. <laughs> so I would say if it's a brand new piece that has never been done before, I would say three to four months if we want to perfect it. Otherwise, if it's a simple, quick thing, it could be two weeks, two months. But if it's like a table like this one that we've already made before, so now we've done the big decision part, and it's a matter of changing the color or the pattern or making it bigger, that doesn't take too long. You know, it's just a matter of a few drawings and a few sketches, and some samples, and then and then uh, production starts. Mm -hmm. So. But there are some pieces that have taken six months, depending on, on the level of uh, details that we, we do. And I actually really like um, things that take time because I feel the more it takes time, the more people will love it because it's, it's taken its time to finish. 
And I think we shouldn't fear, sorry for the noise, but it's we okay. shouldn't fear um, time. We shouldn't fear the fact that things are uh, taking their time. I think we should actually uh, value that. We shouldn't rush the craftsmen because when you rush them and you rush the finishing phase, it's not going to be nice. So, you know, we have to think of furniture as, especially furniture that has the soul of the craftsman in it. That's not done by machine. It's done by human hand. I think over time, uh, the value goes up. So let it take its time because it gets better and better as time flies, you know? So mm. I think that it's important that we, we value the time that it takes. Um, okay. You know, today, yeah, I say slow mm. is the new fast. Yeah. <laughs> okay, understanding this period of time and all this technology and uh, steps and sequence of uh, doing the product, did yeah. you find the clients appreciating uh, the product itself with its price when they buy it? Or yeah. did you find someone who's actually surprised from prices while they understand, even if it's not matching their economic situation, but in just in case? Well, to be honest, and I think that people lately, the past few years, I've noticed that people really are not surprised. Like, I know I'm known uh, to be expensive, but it's not that I'm expensive. I'm actually just, uh, it's just, um, if, I, if I show the process, it doesn't surprise the clients. Actually, they get surprised how cheap it <laughs> when they see the incredible work that's involved in the, in the details, you know, so um, again, you know, we also in a way in the Arab world have a little bit of, um, you know, uh, we're not confident when we're not confident in our what we do, we kind of assume that things that are made in the Arab world mm -hmm. shouldn't be expensive. And I think that that's a wrong way to think. I think we need to value who we are. And when something is done with inc impeccable work, like for example, this, this coffee bean table, it takes about 90 kilos of mother oil and, and all these pieces are put by hand. Like Sorry. this is considered like super, Nada, can you um, Can you repeat the table again? Because uh, the sound was glitching. Oh, Sorry. the sound was glitching. Okay. Sorry. So basically this coffee bean table that was made with you know 90 kilos of mother of pearl and done in such intricate manner like there's no way it doesn't have its value so for me it's not about where it's made it's it's the amount of work that's involved and the finish especially that we're trying to achieve so we're just as good as you know the european work or just as good it's when there's a human soul in the work i think that it deserves its value and I'm noticing that people are, are really appreciating it because they're feeling the soul, they're feeling the energy of the, of, uh, of the pieces. Um, and, you know, for me, it's like cooking for someone you love. The food is so good and you can't explain it. <laughs> and same as, you know, when you, when you do this craft, there's an energy of, of, uh, of someone giving so much attention to the piece that it's, I think its um, value goes in that it's a machine. Machine cannot do it. True. But we was keeping the advice to to the designers in the last, but actually we already crossed that question. But we have another question, yeah. so we'll, yeah. we'll we'll take it. And uh, this question from Layan: Other than materiality and materials, where do you find inspiration from? Um, other than materials, I find inspiration from people. I find inspiration from movies uh, and so movies and film and uh, fashion are fast moving uh, economies, I would say. So that means we start knowing people's tastes from in, for ahead of time when we look at fashion. So let's say, for example, the bold uh, fashion is now going into bold colors like they're using reds and greens and blues and in unusual color combination and people are loving it. So, you know, maybe, you know, that's a trend. And this is what I start saying, okay, maybe my furniture should have some bold colors because it shows that that's what people are, are loving these days. 
or now, for example, like I was saying, like with this organic today, you know, that bo boho look, you know, with the mm. straw weaving, that's very popular. So I'm like, why, why can't I apply it using our craft? And so this is where I started creating like this, uh, you know, the kind of organic shapes, because it looks like this is the trend today, that boho chic kind of uh, uh, natural look. And so I'm very much into what's happening in terms of lifestyle. So beach, going to the beach, you know, that kind of look, bungalows in the Maldives. Uh, mm. And then you look at movies, you look at, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, for example, the pol politics. I mean, even part of this whole blast, I mean, the situation influenced uh, the choice of uh, colors that we we did because it's reflecting our emotions today. So emotions are something we need to look at too. Okay, so we I will. I hope that answered. Yes, yeah. uh, we have last question and we can wrap up okay. with it. Uh, the okay. question is, what are the skills that you find essential in your work design, let's say dash wise and business? Uh, what, uh, wait, can you ask again? Sorry. Okay, what are the skills, are the skills? You, you find essential in your work, in your design work? Okay. Plus business and, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, okay, skills. Hmm. Uh, in, in terms of design, I think, you know, like literally we need good renders, people who render really well, because clients need to see good renders or good sketching. Uh, AutoCAD drawing, um, uh, because today, you know, we need, we, we could, we, you know, in the past they used to do sketches and put sizes and the craftsman would know, but today craftsmen have become, you know, educated even in their uh, drawings, <laughs> when they look at drawings. Um, other skills, sales skills is important. And when I say sales, that means listening to the client. Actually, we don't pitch before we listen to the client. So that's something that we need to be really aware of is listen, listening skills. You know, um, mm. you listen first and then you put your ideas in. But you need to make sure that you listen to all their, because at the end, the pieces, especially in my case, when it's uh, customized, the pieces are uh, going to a client. So we actually create a good brief. So this is what's important, is a very clear brief at the beginning. And, you know, I believe in this 80-20 philosophy, uh, which is 20% is, 80% is coming up with the brief and making it clear and have a plan. 20% is execution. So planning is very important. You have, you have the idea, the brief, the samples, the drawing, all set. And then it's just a matter of getting the approval and going forward. So... I think applying the 80-20 rule is really important. And then when it comes to costing, I think you have to always benchmark your prices. So like when we price, okay, we have, uh, we have to just keep in mind what's also priced worldwide also. So I, I always benchmark my pieces with like-minded people internationally. So you know, I would look at, let's say in France, if they, they had a table similar to this size with this amount of craft, um, I would look at their pricing and then I would look at our costing and then I, we work accordingly. So that's very important. And what else is important? I would say the, the process, production process is important, uh, making sure you check along the way until finishing. These are important uh, steps. Never let go, you know, don't trust. Just, just do quality control all along. This way you don't get disappointed, neither does the client at the end. Mm -hmm. And also you have to keep the client informed all the time. Like we have to be there for the client. The client comes first. So okay. these are some of my tips. <laughs> yeah, we, we are so glad being uh, with you today and visiting yeah. you virtually. Hopefully things will back to normal and we will be there uh, physically, let's say. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so for giving much. us the opportunity. I was so and... happy to...
to have you here. I feel like I just, you know, had like, you know, so many guests coming. Well, actually, the, the, the surprise <laughs> that the, even even we prepared some questions, we didn't go all of them, and we had another no? questions. Yeah, we actually had different ones, which is more yeah. exciting actually. And yeah. uh, I know that you have lockdown, so uh, I'm sure you have to leave. So I think we can wrap up now. And uh, okay. thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you really again. And thank you, everyone. Thank who you was for inviting us. me. Thank yeah. you. Thank Take you. Care. Take care. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.